people are constantly raising the bar. Sacrifices need mm. to be made. What would you guys say are your biggest weaknesses? You or your enemy right now? It's success or die. Just a fucking podcast. Hey guys, welcome to the Hypertrophy Hustle Show. Um, today I'm talking to Jacob Templar. He is a... I have actually got that wrong. Hold up. I wrote down Dr. Templar. Um, he is a doctor of physical therapy. He is the injury, injury management coach for the strength guys. And his nine to five is he is a physiotherapist. So, Jacob, how did you get on, into all this and how did this all start? How did you get to where you are today? Um, well, I guess like the long would be... Um, so I went to uh, university, college, as we say it over here in the States. Um, at Utica, I did my undergraduate work there. Um, I have a bachelor's of science in health studies, which is like a general health science degree. It, it's kind of like a pre-PT. Um, you can you can go on and do like a few other things with it, but <clears throat> so I did that. Um, I think I, I did like the traditional like once I got into college, became like the college gym bro. Um, so kind of like followed a lot of stuff. I think that's when like bodybuilding.com was like still on its upswing mm. where they covered a lot more content with like the Olympia and like stuff like that. Uh, so kind of got into like the bodybuilding scene, like followed guys like uh, Phil Heath and Flex Lewis and uh, uh, um, Warren, especially. Um and then gradually started getting introduced to the guys like uh, Matt Ogus and Eric Helms and Lee Norton and people like that. So more science focused. Um, so when I got in my grad school, like that's when I found more like 3DMJ and stuff like that. So once I finished my grad degree or um, undergrad degree, sorry, um, you have to do it's like a three and three over here. Um, in the U.S., you have to have a doctorate to get to practice as a physio. So um, we finish our undergrad and then do the graduate work. Um, from there, I did a couple powerlifting meets while I was in grad school. Still, did like the what's called the RPS Federation and like another. It's not really like a federation, but this gym does like a, a USAPL rules uh, meet that I did like a push pull and some stuff like that. Um, started getting more into like powerlifting and the training protocols with that, um, through various, you know, more science based fitness approaches. Um, graduated. I had some pretty bad clinical experiences too at my first few. Um, so we have to do like an orthopedic one which is like at my school, we did like a six week one and that one was like horrific for me. Um, and then you have to do a hospital one and I hated that. Like that was the only time in my schooling where I would wake up and say like, do I need to pass this? <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Like with, with my current degree, it's a lot of that. It's like, I, I, I like it most of the time, but there's certain parts of it that I just fucking despise. I just cannot do it. So I know for me, like I'm going to do a master's in exercise science after this, so I can actually do something that I more enjoy and actually like. For you, was it sort of like a placement, yeah. or sort of like you had a certain clinic or something? Yeah, it's like a placement. So you have to do one at least in like a a hospital or a nursing home or like rehab facility where somebody had like a joint replacement or her had just gotten out of the hospital but can't go home yet, mm -hmm. like stuff like that. Um, cause they want you to do like different settings and everybody originally, when they go into, to a PT school, usually wants to do like sports or like orthopedics. Um, and that's kind of where I fell. And then I fell out of favor of it because of a clinical I had. And my last clinical was actually really good and I excelled there. So then it got me back into orthopedics. <clears throat> so what is, so in, in terms of that, was that what got you into because I see you talking quite a lot about this, about sort of issues with surgery and sort of reasons not to get specific surgeries. Um, and I feel like before we talk about this, we should sort of preface it. In terms mm. of surgeries, do you want to give your overall sort of opinion on them? And then 
also specifically what type of surgeries like for instance i don't know your thoughts on this but i had a, a scoliosis spinal fusion um so i had t3 to l2 um i was 55 degree i had a 55 degree curvature when i was fused so it was pretty large okay. so yeah that's pretty large and I, yeah i was like 12 so it was like yeah it kind of had to happen um we yeah. never tried bracing we found it when it was like 35 degrees already or maybe even mm. 40 so it was it was quite late um but yeah in in terms of your thoughts on surgeries what surgeries do you i guess disagree with or what surgeries do you think are okay not okay when what situations all that yeah i mean so in general i'll speak like to orthopedic ones just because i mean i know some data about other ones uh, but obviously my area of expertise is going to be orthopedics um so like from what i've seen the majority of orthopedics when they like trial them against the placebo at like one to two years end up being like no better mm. or it could be even a little bit worse do you want to quickly and, uh, explain what you mean by orthopedics yeah so like anything to do with bones joints muscles right um, is it commonly like stuff like a knee replacement or um would this fall under the same category i was a while ago going to have a ha a wrist surgery because my capsule around here was too loose because i have ligamentous laxity mm -hmm. would that be under the okay. same basket so yeah any, anything yeah. to do with fixing a joint to make it sort of normal again or yeah okay. essentially cool um so like a lot of them that i like as i've looked more into since after graduating and and just adapting the mindset of being like evidence-based practitioner um and especially getting involved in like um mechanical diagnosis and therapy most people know it as mckenzie um like you see different things and when you look into it you're like oh wow um like you know um they did a big review on like knee scopes like for meniscus and stuff like that they did a couple of them because it actually took them, I think it was like 35 years to them for them to do an RCT on like knee or arthroscopy. What's an RCT? So randomized control trial. All right, yeah. So like the people were doing the procedure, and then there was no like evidence yet to say that it was good or bad. <laughs> they were just like by biological like feasibility they were like yeah that makes sense so let's do the procedure right and then when they actually compare compared it to like just opening like putting portals on somebody's knee and then sewing them back up that was no better and in some cases you'd be worse from the arthroscopy because they actually go in and take tissue out or disrupt tissue so then it inherently carries more risk mm. so would you say is that common for the majority of surgeries like that? Um, for a lot of them, it is. Like, it's surprisingly that way. Like, one of the things I looked at was Ian Harris has a lecture. He's a orthopedic surgeon. And, and he actually has a book called Surgery, the Ultimate Placebo. And he had a lecture he did for, like, the Massage Therapy Association. Um, and he covers a lot of that stuff. And I can, I can only imagine, like the arguments this guy gets into with people um, because he's an orthopedic surgeon and he's actively like saying a lot of these orthopedic surgeries or surgeries in general are like not very good. Mm. That's kind of, I think it's scary to hear because I mean like I would have easily gone and got that wrist surgery, but I mean for me, like I've just basically done other things like I've strengthened my tendons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so mm -hmm. tried to generally strengthen around the area and just tried to not fuck it up. Um, and it's generally tend tended to work pretty well. Like it seems to be, would you say that's generally the approach that is a generally better approach? So say if someone has, and then in what situations is that not a good approach? Like for instance, in old age with knee replacements, is there a place for that? Is there not a place for that? Is it, the, obviously it depends on the context um but yeah would you say 
the majority of the time is sort of strengthening it around the area probably a better idea? Or what is the general approach? Yeah, I mean, I think, like, like you said, it's all context specific. Like, there are certain procedures, like I just went over today on my, like, Instagram post uh, with, like, labrums. Mm. And it's like, it's like a 50-50 if you get better without doing a surgery. Um, so it says, like, if you really don't want to have one, there's still a good percentage that you can probably get by and do well. Um, but there's moderate level evidence to say, like, yeah, if you get this, like, instability fixed, it'll not happen again. It's less likely. Uh, and then, too, like, you see with, like, rotator. Technically, when you compare it to placebo, it's not better after a year or two years. Mm. But at the same time, like if somebody can't like use their arm at all and like can't sleep at night and stuff like that, that's like you know you have to also about like sometimes what's your quality of life going to be like and like can you work? Can you like do things like that? Mm. And that's the thing, I guess. Like for me, the wrists weren't too disabling. Like it was both wrists at mm -hmm. one point because the I think I had to use the other wrist to compensate for the lack of use of the other wrist. Like, but at one point, both wrists were immobilized, so it was like okay, it was because I was a dishwasher, and then like okay. when I was like I was, it would have been sixteen or something, and I was washing dishes six days a week, and then I had like weak weak wrists, and then I think my wrist just slowly took the damage, um, and then I think. They just immobilized it and then we just slowly worked up some range of motion and tried to make them actually work better. And it was pretty close to surgery. Like it would have been funded by the government and all that. Um, mm. But I sort of said, nah, because I want to lift. Um, yeah. And it's like, it tended to work pretty well. Like now I can pretty much do it. There's nothing that my wrists limit. Um, they're never really the causing, they're never really the issue nowadays. Um, would you, is, is generally, what would you say is generally a better alternative to surgery in those cases where surgery is not actually that good of an option so if it's like not good of an option or like you just don't want it um for the most part obviously like natural history usually trumps everything um but obviously like exercise hmm. is beneficial like strengthening um so the way that i'm trained through like uh mechanical diagnosis and therapy um, we look for like what's called a directional preference, um, which can exist in any joint. And it's essentially like if, like if somebody didn't get better already with a natural history, like why hasn't that happened? Like it's much more research in the spine to show like that there's indications for it. But I've seen it like in extremity joints too, like shoulder, wrist, uh, elbow, all that stuff. But, like, I've had patients come in and say, like, um, teaching them to mobilize that joint, like, they'll, they'll have had, like, an issue for, like, years on, a, on and off or, like, ongoing. Um, I can think of one recently. I had a – she's 12. I mean, she probably would have gotten better with anything that I didn't, did with her. But um, she had had PT before to do, like – she had patellofemoral pain is what they like that's the common label they'll give to like somebody that's a preteen or teen mm -hmm. like especially girl with knee pain um so she had had pt before did strength thing got better but like keeps coming back um doesn't didn't really seem to like have that much of an immediate effect or it's like so i tested mo moving her joints around um to like end ranges which you'd call like a mobilization like taught her how to do it and they went on a trip to Paris um, and walked, like, everywhere. And she was, like, a runner. And she's like, yeah, I can, like, if I my knee starts to hurt, I can do that. That movement takes it away, and then I can keep going and do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. So like, what's occurring there? Like, what 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 is the – because it's the kind of thing for me where it's like, whoa. And I think – because I guess, like, when I think of physios in New Zealand, every time I've gone to a physio – the treatment has always been okay. We add in strengthening exercises, or we add in mm -hmm. K tape, something like that. You know, um, yeah, we do a bit of that at uni as well. And I think, obviously, I think 
I can tell by your opinion on it. I agree. Um, it is a bit like, you know, what is a piece of tape going to do? But placebo is great. So, you know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. Sometimes an ounce of placebo can work a lot in your favor. Yeah. Like, for me, like, even though, even though I know K tape doesn't work, like, I put some on my knee a while ago when I was at work because I was getting, I think I've just overloaded my, um, what is it? What? I should know this. Fuck. What is it? My patella tendon. Yeah. Yeah. Patella tendon. Um, and it was just getting pain in there. So I literally just put some K tape over it and then it was kind of fine. <laughs> so it's just like, okay, cool. But then, I mean, would you, uh, would you advise against stuff like that? I think it's, it's dependent. Like it, if it, like, it's okay. Like say if it's a placebo, but it takes you like two seconds to do it. Like, hmm okay, let's do that because it's not really wasting your time and taking effort away from stuff that's like going to be the long term more beneficial. Mm. Um, that's like right now the hot debate is on like, it's not even a hot debate because foam rolling really hasn't been shown to be like largely beneficial for a lot of things. Like it can help a little bit with doms after training um, and like use that way, but it's not technically going to like speed up your recovery. Right. Like it'll make you feel better, um, but there's probably other things you can be, like, spending your time on doing, like, mm. actually sleeping and, like, eating and, like, you know, like, big picture stuff. Yeah, and it's sort of like the minutia. Do you feel like a lot of people in terms of all this stuff get trapped in the minutia and sort of think, oh, this thing's going to work or I'm going to do some cupping or I'm going to do some X, Y, and Z, and then that's going to be the thing that works and then, then they just completely forget about shit like sleep yeah like that probably happens a lot and and then like while they're doing that like natural history and by them just continuing to move is like working its course and then mm -hmm. they get better and then but then they associate <laughs> because I did cupping that's why I got better right <laughs> so then they think it's the the K tape or the cupping or the is there a bunch yeah. is is there anything in particular you see you see I guess either physios doing or other medical practitioners doing in terms of recovery that you think is sort of quite a bad idea or not really doing much? I mean like the biggest thing out here is that like so you know the I don't know if you've seen like an ultrasound machine that's like not for imaging. Um I don't think so. I know yeah, so we like, have the thing where it's like, um, I think it essentially does the same job as foam rolling. It's like a gun that just hits the thing. It's like a... Yeah, like a Theragun. Yeah. So, like, we have that are common to see in, like, PT clinics out here where it's, like, an ultrasound, but the frequency is different. So there's no, like, return head to pick up an image. Um, so because the frequency is different, it, it essentially, like, vibrates the cells and creates like a heat energy but this heat that it creates has actually been shown like almost not to do anything like therapeutically right other than placebo and like it's not even better than like flipping a coin machine like they had it on it like so it sounded like it was on and just rubbed it on somebody and it got the same effect as if they actually like put it on yeah so it's yeah i feel like that's the same thing with a lot of things like when we were um, no we were talking about those vibram shoes a while ago and it's like i did a post yeah. on them yesterday and it's kind of like i mean i don't want to like be a dick and just tag the specific people who sort of use them and tout them a lot and talk about them and but I mean, I think, yeah. I, I don't know if you follow the British bodybuilding scene a lot, but they're very, I wouldn't say clicky, but they there's if there's a trend in there, the trend goes throughout the whole fucking course of them. Um, yeah. And that's like my scene. I mean, I live in New Zealand, but my scene is like British bodybuilding. Like they, that's my like um, general fitness sort of group. Um, and with the Vibram shoes, right? It's like, it's gone. One of them fucking had it. And then someone else got it, then someone else, and it just goes in a bloody whole thing. And it's like, I mean, I know the guy who is, who's sort of perpetuated it, 
And like, I went mm. to his workshop a while ago just to sort of see and have a geese. And it was interesting. I think a lot of it was bullshit. But it was like, it was a lot of, a lot of it was focused on stuff like grounding and um, like the Vibram shoes and the nasal strips. And I mean, maybe there's useful benefits on some of those things, but it's very like, how much does that actually matter? I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, it's like with heat ultrasound, like these machines cost like, I think it's like three to $4,000 a piece. <laughs> and like, it's in my textbook at school, which means that it, when I was at school, which is like years ago, hmm. well, like three year, three years ago now, and the textbook is probably like five years old. Hmm. Uh, and then you got to take into account that the research that's in it, it's probably like 10 to 20 years old. Hmm. And the research, like, from like the nineties on it's literally said like research is like, yeah, it's no better than placebo. Like it's no better than anything else. Mm. But like we continue to teach physios about it. Like you need to know it to pass your board exam, but it's literally a treatment that does nothing. Mm. And like, that's, that's like one of the fundamental problems with like the profession mm. is that there's a lot of like just shit out there that we keep teaching people yeah um and especially like like teaching people about like dysfunctions and shit like that too like the only correlations on imaging right now with like having a problem with a joint like what we define as a human as being a problem with your joint because it doesn't look like how it looks like in a textbook is age like the older you are, the more likely that anything is going to show up on an image. Hmm. So would you say effectively, do you think we're classing too many things as abnormal? Yeah, like we typically do. And there's, um, there's actually a lot of research into it as far as like even like primary care, like um, yearly physicals and like dental exams and stuff like that, that we tend to have this, this, tendency and then, and then like um what's it that the functional movement assessment like same thing like there's a lot of things that come up that we like look at and we're like yeah that's a problem but then when we follow it like long term like it actually doesn't do anything to impair somebody's health and just by me telling them that it was a problem it actually creates more damage than yeah. anything that's the thing it's like until you know something's a problem it's like doesn't feel like it's a problem and I feel like people would seem to want to have a problem now. It's like they, yeah. Well, it's almost like I mean that's more, in that sense I mean it more like um, sort of with mental stuff, like everyone wants to have a mental disability or something. Um, mm. Like for instance, every kid my age thinks they've got ADHD, like, and I mean it's just like I kind of think kids just want to think they've got that. It's like yeah. It's, Which, it's, like, I think you said that you're, like, 21 or 20. Yeah, I'm 20, so, yeah. Yeah, and I'm tw so I'm 26. And, like, I've been, well, I've technically been, like, DSM diagnosed with ADHD hmm. since I was, like, four. And hmm. I've been tested, like, you have to, it, like, in American schools, you have to be tested to have, like a, like, a learning plan and stuff like that. Right. And, like, I was for, like, my board exams for, like, PT and all that. So you have to get tested a lot. And it's essentially like a rule-out diagnosis. My sister's a, a, a early school psychologist, too. She has her PhD in it. Hmm. So, like, I've talked at length with her. And um, so you, you have to, like, go through the, all these steps hmm. to get diagnosed with it. And it's like, no, you don't have it, like... Yeah, it's like you said, like all these people want to have it. Yeah. And, and, and they'll like, go on Google yeah, and be like, oh, should I have one of these three personality traits? It's yeah. like, okay, you don't have a mental disorder now that disables you from studying. It's like, yeah. People want to be like, oh, shit, I'm, I have ADHD. I can't study properly now. It's like, fuck, just work harder. Shut up. Like, come on. Exactly. Yeah, especially because, like, um, I did a project on it in school in, like, developmental neuro. Hmm. And, um, so the statistics are in like the United States, like people with ADHD that actually graduate with a degree is like, it's like, I think like less than 10%. It's something outrageously low. Hmm. And like the, the, there's not even a statistic for 
people with ADHD like having a, a doctoral degree. Right. Because there's just not enough of them to like have a statistic. Right. Is it? There's just not enough people with ADHD that actually have a diagnosis, or is it the fact? Is it they just? There's not enough of them that get that far in, in right. college. Right. But then kids are trying to say that they've got ADHD when they're doing fine in school. It's just they want to be lazy or something, or because that's yeah, what it kind it's... of feels like. Because it's like, oh shit, I go on my phone a lot. I get pretty distracted by my phone. It's like, okay, cool no shit yeah it's just because you're in your 20s and your brain isn't fully <laughs> developed so you have don't just don't have impulse control yeah that's that's kind of what it feels like eh? it's a bit um a bit fucked up but one thing i would like to get your thoughts on um either of the two subjects so i'll give you an option whichever one you think you have more thoughts on um so either scoliosis or orthotics do you have thoughts on either of those I probably know more, like, scoliosis-wise. Like, I mean, I treat a lot of people that have it. They have incidental, but they don't have, like, a... I think... See, because I'm not, like, an expert on scoliosis, per se. Mm. Like, I treat a lot of spine patients. Mm. But, like, I think you'd have, like, a 10 to 15-degree curve and never have it affect you again for your life. But, Mm. like, even at that point, some people will tell you, like, you should probably get it monitored for a while. Mm. But I, I, I know once you get past, like, I don't know if, like, the number off the top of my head. But once you get past a certain curvature, they do recommend surgery more mm. as a beneficial option for people. So, like, definitely your curve was, like, that's pretty large. Yeah, yeah. that's, like, the majority of people who get surgery. I think it needs to be over 45 degrees or something. And then they pretty yeah. much recommend surgery. And it's the kind of thing where it's, like, a no-brainer. It's, like... You yeah, know, like if I didn't have surgery, they said I couldn't. I wouldn't be able to walk at this age. So like I would be crippled basically now. And like, you, yeah, you compare like, that to what I do now. It's like I lift weights every day. Like I've run yeah. a half marathon. I'm fine. I just can't bungee jump. That's about it. <laughs> Which and I'm then like, with. but even like orthopedic or orthotics. I mean, I think it depends because I mean, not to say that like podiatrist over here don't know what they're doing or anything like there's a lot of them that obviously are skilled like you have to be to get through the program mm. and like smart um but it's like sometimes like the solutions it's just like any medical practitioner actually offers people it's like okay this person's had supposedly had flat feet for like 40 years like why is it that like two months ago that their feet started hurting yeah it's like it's probably not because I don't know, it feels a bit like, ever since I've got involved in podiatry, it seems a bit like we get taught by some very good people and they tell us, the like, don't, they basically said when we started learning about orthotics, they were basically like, don't just prescribe orthotics because mm-hmm. it's an easy fix or it's it's an easy thing to just throw at someone. Um, I mean, it, like, what we've been shown is there is good research behind actually modified orthotics, but it's hard to conduct mm-hmm. good research on them. But it's like... yeah from what we've been taught it's like a lot of practitioners seem to just throw an orthotic at someone and it's like yeah. they don't fucking need it like this it's it's kind of a bit like okay they cost a lot of money and it's something that you, you just throw out there it's like maybe there's a correlation between the two it's like it, it earns a clinic a lot of money and it's not I mean, there's other, it has it pretty much has to be combined with something else to work properly and it's like yeah i i know like i saw somebody recently that came from a podiatrist and so i like assessed for like directional preference and stuff like that found a really strong one and i and then like i teach everybody like strengthening and, and just general activity anyways as preventative measures i mean technically like the stronger your tissues are the less likely there, you're going to have any perceived threats to that tissue. Hmm. Um, so I'm like, okay, here's something we can do right away to change your range of motion quickly and your, your pain. Uh, we found that. Okay, now let's find what strengthening program you can continue to do to, as preventative and then teach them that things. I think I saw this woman like three or four times and she's like, yeah, I have plantar fasciitis and a heel spur and Achilles calcification. Shit. 
and, I, and she's like, but I'm better, and it's only been, like, it was like three or four times. Well, like, she was completely better. Was that with the podiatrist or with you? When, 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 so someone, the podiatrist told her that she had all that, and then after yeah. three or four appointments, she was, she was sort of. Like, completely symptom-free. Like, she was so, in so much pain when I first started in it, it wasn't like it was a new issue for her either. Um, like, they wanted to, their next step, what they told her was going to be for her to get surgery. I don't know what, what surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, but especially like ankle surgeries, I know typically are, they're more rare. Like that's why people don't get like an, when they get, have an ankle sprain, they don't get like an MRI. Yeah. Like that's my cynical side of me that says like, you don't get an ankle MRI because they don't often do surgeries to fix an ankle versus like your knee. Like if your meniscus is torn or like your, your, you tear a ligament, they're like, okay, let's fix your ACL. Hmm. Yeah. And I think it's, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, ever since I've sort of got into sort of medicine, it's like, shit, I don't, it's much more like, fuck, I don't know who I can trust. Like, yeah, I used to worry about, um, like, for instance, chiros, and then you compare mm-hmm. that to, like, osteos, and then people don't even, even understand the difference between those and a physio, and then those and a podiatrist, and yeah. it's like, one as a medical practitioner who talks to people i still don't have any fucking clue like i barely know what an osteopath does barely know what a chiro does barely know if they're even like with chiros right it's like you only hear either really good things or really fucking bad things so it's just like i don't know obviously i'm sure there's some use of them if they've trained for that long maybe it's like there, there has to be some sort of use surely but it's like i feel like the more i get into this it's like shit i don't know I, I'm I I almost lose faith in medicine because it's like, okay, my university doesn't know how to treat obesity, and Eric Helms studied at my university, but we can't figure out what calories are. It's yeah. like, it seems a bit, and that's my podiatry class sort of talking about how to treat obesity. It's like, okay, why are we treating the symptoms of obesity when really you just need to reduce their weight? It's like that feels so fundamental. It's like. The reason they're having these yeah. problems is because they're so overweight. Why don't we try well, and reduce that? I I have like usually where I am. So I live in Rochester, New York, um, which is like known for the University of Rochester, which is like a big medical center, like teaching hospital. Um, and actually, like the founder of what's called the biopsychosocial approach to medicine was like a uh, psychiatrist. Yeah, he was a psychiatrist at the university. And and so, like, the system here is a lot better than when I, where I worked in Syracuse, New York, before. Um, but still, like, some of the stuff that happens, you're just like, what? Like, um, and, like, I have friends that here that are, like, chiros that I would trust more with my patients than, like, some physios that I know. Mm. Just because they're, like, on the same weight look wavelength um shit i had like a specific example i can't remember it now yeah i think it's the kind of thing where i think it comes down to the specific practitioner Uh, there's people in my class who i know i would probably recommend a patient to and there's people i wouldn't dare recommend a patient to so it's like yeah that's the thing you if you just go and google podiatrist near me or whatever it's like shit are you going to get a good medical practitioner or a bad one because i kind of think that's the reality uh maybe and there's no way to fucking tell because no one's saying like, oh, this person yeah. is shit. This person's pretty good because apparently we're all under the same like regulation. We all have our governing bodies, and the governing bodies check that we're up to scratch. But then it's like you 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 still get podiatrists who go off this one model, which basically goes around trying to fix the foot to neutral. But there is no like neutral yeah. because like it's subjective. Every foot is unique. Like you cannot just make a foot straight and then call it neutral like yeah well and like you see that in my profession too it's like you come in and they tell you like your hip is like out of position and you're rotated and you have a weak core and like all this shit and then like like i'll we talk between us and the coaches and like if if somebody's got an athlete with an issue 
um, a lot of the coaches now will like message me and be like, hey, this is what my athlete said about like provider that they want to. What does that sound like to you? Like, and they'll give me like more details and stuff. And like a couple of them be like, yeah, is that like a shit provider? Like, should I have them try and find somebody else? Or like, do you know anyone in the area? Right. And then it's just like, sh- is there certain things? Is is there any way you've found to like identify a decent practitioner? I guess maybe it's physio dependent, but because um, I guess like with the the general population, when the, they're never gonna know like the specific tests that are useful and aren't useful, and the specific like yeah. theories to go by that are and aren't useful. Um, like my biggest thing is like if. It's like they spend time like teaching you and they don't like it's one thing to take somebody's framework of like hey what do you understand about this condition and like what you have going on and then working off of that and then maybe reteaching or reframing it's another to be like hey your core is weak and this and that's out of alignment and i have to put it back in and like stuff like that so like those are some red flags right away um and then like like I probably come off as like pretty wishy-washy to my patients because I know that it's like context dependent and like there's like a lot of gray areas and so like it's it's like hard to work in evidence-based like actual medicine yeah because people are like want the black and white answer and you're like that solution that just yeah and it like and even to say like yeah, and even to say, even when I have an image done on somebody, like, this is specifically what's going on with you. Like, just our understanding of, like, pain, we know that that's not how that works. Mm. Um, especially for the last, like, I want to say, like, 10 years, like, David Butler and Lorimer Mosley, which I believe are both Australian physios, like, pain researchers. Um, and there's like guys like Mick Thacker, who's like a lecturer and he's like, I think he's doing like a second PhD in like pain in like universe in uh, UK where it's like, they come up with these, this like stuff in like context of pain. And it's just like, wow. Like, I don't know anything about like, bio, like biomedicine. Like, why do they still teach us that? Hmm. Do you think, um, like, is there a lot of shit to do with pain where it's like a lot of it's. Because I know there's a lot of people talking about pain science right now. And is it, yeah. is it like, what is the general consensus on that? Like, I know a lot of people talk about pain centric language and stuff like that. And like, mm. we talk a little bit about it in my degree, but we're just undergraduate. We seem to fo- cover everything relatively low level or relatively sort of not that in depth. Um, yeah. And we forget, of a, forget a lot of it because we're just here trying to pass. Yeah. I mean, it probably has the most weight as far as like anything I have is like a tool because it's less like I'm doing pain science is like that's like just at least your framework and how you can reframe things and teach like body positivity and like preventative measures and stuff Mm -hmm. and like kind of like unmind fuck people like from being like, oh, I have shitty posture and I have (laughs) degenerative discs and that's why my back hurts. Mm. to like hey like you know yeah that might be true but you know like oh did you see how we did this today when before like you couldn't do that or like hey you're you know like i guess but i at least try and get people to like deadlift and like goblet squat and stuff Mm. Mm. um because we have dumbbells i'm Mm. like hey you notice like you told me when you came in like you had a hard time lifting your kid that's like 50 pounds and you just like deadlifted like a hundred pounds and you see how like you're able to do this now and it doesn't like you're not having pain and it's not you know making you stiff or anything yeah and sort of disproving what people think about themselves like i know when i had before i started lifting i had scoliosis i sort of thought i was like Mm. slowly just going to degenerate into nothing just because oh, yeah. I'm just guaranteed fucked. There's some research on degenerative disc disease and people with spinal fusions, blah, blah, blah. I'm fucked. But then it's yeah. like, okay, I start lifting. At the start, it's reasonably painful. But nowadays, it's like, okay, I get a little bit of costochondritis. Um, rarely, I'll have a little bit of back pain, like just mm-hmm. lower back pain. But it's like so minor. And it's like compared to where it was before I lifted, it's like 
fucking nothing. And I don't know if it's just strengthening of all the muscles. And I do like bodybuilding style training, but it's like, well, in, and you I develop, feel really fucking better. So, so essentially you develop like more resiliency throughout your whole like body, like not only the tissues that you're training, but your nervous system uh, essentially like has a new understanding of like context hmm. for like movement and things like that. At least, I mean, like I'm not like the expert on it. I'm a, I would say I'm a good practitioner, um, and I interpret the research and then apply it to people. And like, I definitely have some friends who like people I interact with a lot on Instagram and stuff that I'm like, oh fuck, like they make me feel like I need to learn way more all the time. So I think that's all of us. Which yeah. is good. That's where you should be. Yeah. Um, but essentially, you like ter- teach your nervous system, like, hey, like. I can do all this stuff and like you build like a, like a more resilient, like as if you were thinking of like a peak of a mountain is like where you start to get pain and there's like a bar that's like, this is my base camp. Um, you're able to bring your, your base camp like higher up on the mountain, Mm. like over time by like introducing strength training and your nervous system gets more acclimated to movements. And I mean, technically like you put, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds like tonnage through the joints and everything in your body's like oh hey this is actually isn't that bad like you know so if you're used to that kind of stuff there's like no reason for like okay i sat down in my chair for like 20 minutes like that shouldn't hurt my back yeah yeah that's the thing it's like i don't know it's it seems as though like I had a shoulder thing a while ago and I went to the physio and they couldn't really figure out what was going on. I mean, it was a student yeah. physio, so they weren't really, I think they were still sort of trying to figure out how to be a physio and stuff. And that's how it is at my uni. Like we're like, I wouldn't expect my classmates to be able to diagnose anything more than like plantar fasciitis. Like, I don't know, like we yeah. think about a solution to it, you know? And, but I mean, we well, sort like, of had... I'm- three years into full-time practice and I, I, I read between, I read at least one journal a week. Mm. Um, some weeks I'll read 50 or more depending mm. on like what projects and stuff I have to do. Mm. Um, and it's like, I'm still trying to figure out stuff. It's like the more I learn, it's like the less I feel like I know. <laughs> and it's like sometimes, sometimes on social media, I'll see people that I'm like, can like retrospectively be like, Oh yeah, they're on that part of the dunning kruger effect where they like have more confidence than the amount of knowledge they actually have yeah 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 that's the fucked up but thing, then right? it's just well and the the fucked up thing is too is like in your brain you're always like wait am i actually at that part <laughs> of like the curve still or am i actually am i good like mm. well i mean it's like we're always gonna have that doubt of like especially in evidence-based because i think a lot of people in evidence-based make content for other yeah. colleagues, I guess, or other people in yep. evidence base, it's like shit. We're always trying to impress everyone in evidence base. Like with my with the footwear thing, I was so scared to put that out because it's. I think it was for some people who follow me. I think it's reasonably controversial because they love Vibrams, they believe yeah. in Vibrams, blah blah blah. Yeah. And it's like ah, uh, I don't want to stir the boat. Like I'm a podcaster. I'm meant to be relatively neutral, but it's like okay, I'm also studying podiatry, and everyone in my course basically thinks this shit is bullshit. And the pronation is just fine, but then other people are saying, "Oh no, blah blah blah, a little bit too much pronation there, mate." Like, "Oh no," um, so it's like, well, it's like at some point, like people just nitpick you to just nitpick you. Mm, like, yeah. I try to be the best that I can, and like I know, like at some point, regardless of who you are, like whether you're actually doing a good job or not, you're gonna get people that just like want to fuck with you. <laughs> um, and, like, this dude, I posted something on my story. I, like, I, I have a whiteboard in my treatment area so I can, like, draw stuff. Mm. I, you know, I'm fairly monotone as it is, so I want to try and keep my patients engaged and, like, draw stuff yeah. for them. And, like, hey, this is, you know, this, this, and that. And I put on there usually every day, like, some kind of trivia, like, some, you know, a, more of a positive message. And I think I had, like, one word just change the phrasing a little bit. And this guy like went off on me and was like, how do you, where do you have the statistics from that? Like, where did you see that? That's not what I saw. And like stuff like that. And he just kept sending me messages. And I was, I was literally about to block him because I was just like, it's not that I disagree with you. Like I understand what you're saying, 
But the amount of messages you're sending me because I had one word that was just like off mm. from what you thought should be stated is ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like it's the internet. You know, people are going to get like fucking but i mean i guess then there's the balance of like oh shit we have to balance the fact that we're a medical practitioner and yeah. i guess even like an online coach i think they still have to class themselves as that you know they still have to say i'm a medical practitioner like you know mm. they kind of have to take i think every every online coach should take that guise and sort of learn what it means to be a decent medical practitioner um and that's what i'm grateful for for doing podiatry but i don't want to be a podiatrist so you know um yeah but I think we all need to take that guise and sort of realize, shit, like, how do we balance being an online person and sort of responding to people online, who a lot of people online are fucking idiots and they just won't, they're not going to see reason. There's no point trying yep. to debate a lot of people on here. Um, and also balancing that with like, oh shit, I have to try and put knowledge out there, blah, 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 and just be a good medical practitioner, which is the hard part, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're breaking up a little bit. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, um, there are a couple times where I've done that. I've debated, like, certain things with people, and, like, um, I made some really good points and, like, used evidence to support my claim, and then mm -hmm. they instantly, I think they said, you, you spend an awful lot of money and time on school just to become a comedian, and so my immediate response to that was, okay, apparently we're not going to have an uh, intellectual debate, and mm. so there's no point in me responding to you, even if you do respond to this again. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of like... like they, they just inst Well, most people who are going to have a good conversation with you, that is an intellectual debate. Not once have I ever seen an insult in it. You know, There's never going to be an insult. There's never going to be any yeah. challenge. It's just like the way you have a good conversation that actually produ produces anything... As you sit down and you're actually trying to figure out the problem, and there's no like "fuck you," yep. you know, like, there's just none of that because there's no point. Yeah. It doesn't contribute to the conversation at all. So it's like, yeah, and like, I'll admit when I'm wrong. I I talk to people all the time in like my messages and stuff, hmm. and I'm like, "Hey, what do you think about this?" And they'll be like, "Uh, yeah, I'm not so sure about this," and we'll like sometimes agree to disagree a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. It's like a lot of the stuff is. A lot of it we don't have any clue about. It's like there's certain things where I think there, there, it'll be a long time before we know everything about it. Like still in bodybuilding, it's like hypertrophy wise. We don't. Okay. There's still a lot of shit we don't know. Breaking up quite a bit. There's there's still like shit we don't know in terms of like hypertrophy and all that. But it's like and like literally anything we don't know about. But we're just making our best guess. And then I guess a lot of like subjective opinion comes into it. And like, at the end of the day, it's yeah. like, at this, at this point, like a lot of it is splitting hairs. Like I think most people agree on the majority of stuff. Like, for yeah, instance, yep. in, in bodybuilding, there's the two, there's two major camps currently that I can see. You have the like, reps in reserve, leaving reps in the tank, sort of controlling for volume. Um, generally, this is like, <coughs> this is more like touting evidence you'll talk about evidence blah, blah blah and then you have the like intensity they'll still talk about evidence some of them um but then yep. they'll, they'll also go full to failure and like they'll believe failure is the best always pretty much um and then you have those two camps and there's not many ways to prove who's better apart from i don't even know if results is the best way because then it could be short term and then we could look at injuries in the long term and how long can someone's career be doing this approach compared to that approach and I mean, I'm obviously on the side of like not going to failure, reps and reserve. That's my camp. But it's like I'm yeah. willing to talk to the other side, and I think the other side is relatively open to talking as well. Which I think is the cool thing. Like yep. it's 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 cool that we get to have that conversation, and we can if there's well, mature people in the niche that can have it. And that's been like like kind of the crazy thing for me. Like the last year is that like. I've had all these opportunities that I didn't like essentially like when I started my journey of like being in fitness and stuff like mm. I'm like oh yeah like you know like 3DMJ like those guys are so cool and mm. like uh, Ben Escrow and, and um, you know like I'd heard of the strength guys before that and like all these people 
and now it's like people that I talk to on a regular basis. Yeah, that's so it's been like it's a crazy mind, year. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like, like it's it's really fucking cool, but it's just like shit being able to just speak to these people, and then you realize like okay, two years ago I would have fangirled if they like liked my comment, you know? Like yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. It's like. like I don't know if they'll um, ever get old, eh? Like, I, until I think you interact with them, like, every day, I don't think I'm ever going to get over it. I'm always going to be a little bit, like... Like, my last 10 interviews, I've been like, holy shit. Like, there's been yeah. some people in there where I've been like, holy fuck. Like, I remember when I talked to Nunez, I was like, holy shit, this is Alberto Nunez. Like, I've watched this guy's videos for years, you know? It's yeah. Just like, well, and it's like, I, I, he was actually my coach for a really long time now. Um, so I, I've been using, working with 3DMJ doing the, like their guided programming. Mm -hmm. Um, but then obviously now that I'm in strength guys, like being a part of the group has some perks to it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, monetarily, like it's a lot better, um, you know, cause we all help each other out with stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, especially like I have a kid on the way soon. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then it's like cool too. Cause I get to talk to like, I can, just text Ben, like, if I have a question about something, or, yeah. like, Jason. Yeah. And, uh, like, I talked to Alfred and our one coach, Kedrick, a lot. He's actually going to AUT. Yeah. He's doing yeah. his PhD with uh, Eric is like, his mentor. Mm. Or, yeah. Um, it's, I, I was in Highbury, which is, like, my little town the other day. Yeah. And I was I saw on his Instagram that he was lifting at this place called North Shore Barbell. And I was like, yeah. where the fuck is that? And then I looked on their thing, and it's literally in Highbury. And I thought my whole fucking yeah. life that we only had like shitty like city fitness ass gyms and like one gym that's like basically for old people. And then I realized we have a powerlifting gym like down the fucking road. <laughs> it was like, yeah. what the fuck? You're kidding me. Like I'm hoping to get in, get, I'm hoping to attempt getting back into squatting in like one meso cycle or so. And then I'm currently working with Steve. And then when I unfortunately mm -hmm. had to stop working with Steve, Steve Hall, um, Revive Stronger, um, then I'll hopefully, I might give squatting a go, just for a laugh, almost. Yeah. Um, and that would be a fucking cool place to do it, just because, like, we only have commercial gyms and shit. It's it's just nice how small the community is, but, uh, like, I remember six months ago, I thought there was literally no one good, and there's yeah. literally no one good in fitness in, in New Zealand apart from Helms. Like, that's literally all we had. It felt like me and Helms versus the world. So it's yeah, just yeah. Like... You get like another another person now. Cause... Yeah, and I'm sure more will come. Yeah. because AUT is like a a nice sort of area for it to just all bloom from. Yeah, I think he's doing his PhD on like weight weight cutting mm. with uh, like power athletes. Right. Um, since I think most of it, he we talked about this other day. I think most of it's in like people that are in like endurance sports or like yeah. combat sports. Yeah, yeah. Um. So it's kind of cool because, like, I can just like hop on a call with those guys and like mm. talk for like a couple hours about physiology and yeah. and like, and we like will all learn stuff from each other because mm. they'll like pick my brain about like, hey, what about these aspects of programming, like preventable, like you know, injuries and stuff mm. and like you know, volume considerations and and things like that and like that's some of the stuff that I go over with like being like the injury management guy. Like, if mm. we have somebody that has something going on. I'll like hop on a call with them and, and chat with them and, and figure some stuff out. Um, and then I'll, I write a pretty detailed like write up and send it to the coach and be like, Hey, these are maybe some programming considerations given what they have going on and like current things. Hmm. Here's some like either exercise modifications or like selection things you might want to take into account or like volume considerations or intensity and things like that. Hmm. And is it nice to sort of collaborate in that way? Like, I think it's cool to see, like, how many you know, cool, like, groups there are that, like, actually subscribe to, like, evidence and then work yeah. with that and then work with different practitioners. And then it's cool that that's becoming the thing. Like, that, yeah. like the, that, for instance, like, the strength guys have some fucking cool athletes going to Worlds. It's like, that's, yeah. that's the cool thing. It's like, shit, like, and then... Like people like 3DMJ, they're actually they're getting some followers now. Like people are actually respecting them, and not just yep. thinking, oh, they're only for niche like competition prep. Like most people don't want to do bodybuilding, so it's like you know, it's cool to see that yeah. becoming like the thing. Like evidence based feels like 
we're all like this one little niche, right? It feels like it's pretty small. Mm-hmm. Everyone, like, literally seems to, like everyone fucking knows each other, which is cool. Yeah. But then it's like, I don't, and I think all of us pretty much don't want it to just be us. We want it to expand, which is yep. dope. It's like, we want to sort of take over, which would be cool. <laughs> like, take over some of yeah. the BS out there. Yeah, exactly. Because, like, you see all these people still doing, like, um, like, Kedrick and I were talking about, like, weight cutting. And you're like, once you get over, like, 5%, like that's pretty dangerous and it's pretty detrimental. Like it can be dangerous, I think, for like your kidneys and liver, maybe. Mm. I think we we're talking about because like water loss. Um, but more like it's really detrimental for like your um, performance, mm. at least for the ones that are it's heavily researched in. Mm. Um, it's unsure yet, still like strength sports. But we were talking about like um, subjective. Um, feelings of like recovery and and like subjective like markers and perception of like your health and injury resiliency actually are like really indi- like almost better indicators than like biological indicators yeah and that's the thing it's like i feel like even if we don't know certain things it's like we can always like especially it's like i think a lot of us in evidence base get tied to like oh shit there's no evidence on this though but then it's like subjectively what have we seen with like a hundred people so it's like yeah well like especially like you know jason really loves like his his charts and 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 data and everything and and like we have uh you know a sports scientist and exercise physiologist and everything so like we have a lot of measures that we can use and like he can track a lot of things so it's like um it's good because we can you can objectively look back at it like yeah it's subjective intake but then you can actually look back at it with like more of an objective like lens Hmm. and be like oh hey like these are trends that we saw and maybe try and take some of your bias out of it Hmm. and that's the thing i think it's i don't know i think this whole like approaching it from like especially when different practitioners get to interact it's i think it's a dope sort of thing that we get to do but yeah um i don't want to go on for too long but i want to touch on one more thing in terms of injuries we have a sort of theory that we have at aut or physio and aut we call it um tissue stress theory is that what you guys would have you heard of that is that normal that a big thing is that tiny i'm not sure yeah i mean like i've heard of it yeah yeah. um what would you it's probably going back more to like when i was in school yeah so in terms of that the idea is um and i mean it's similar to what i i would say seems to be the case um if you look at like volume um basically the idea is if you go over your mrv pretty much can get injured um would you generally agree with that i i mean i think like if we were take it into only like biological like tissues ability to adapt and recover um that definitely has play into it um i think the practical application of that is only limited by the fact that like in a vacuum humans have other like psychological aspects like Mm. they have to take into consideration and then societal like stressors yeah um but like as a pure biological like that definitely is a sound theory Mm -hmm. and then is that would you say doing too much volume or too much work would that generally be the cause of most injuries or is it sort of how common would you say it's sort of just a freak accident or um excluding things like a car crash like there are usually like predisposing factors that we can at least like notice whether it's like your recovery wasn't there or like psychologically your um like fatigue was more or like you didn't at least feel more recovered Mm. um and that impacted like the result of an injury um and then there's also like uh tim i forget his last name tim gabber maybe Mm. he's known a lot for like sports recovery we've talked about him between us coaches a few times Mm. and like different things that we've seen Uh, but there's also the idea of like uh it's like stress strain and I think strain has to do with like monotony of program too. Um, so inherently you can have like a little bit of variation to a program 
and that can be enough to allow for recovery um, between like, you know, oh, I'm doing another, like, you know, like if you just ran the same, pro- even with like the best program ever, mm-hmm. and you just ran the same stuff every single day, like obviously you're going to be bored with that after a while. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be maybe a, it can pre this expose you maybe to more problems mm. just because of the stress of that yeah and i think it seems as though like i th- do you would you say in general most people who aren't in evidence-based fitness are either sort of don't really think about volume or don't really control for volume and would you say volumes would, would you generally agree with the sort of statement that volume is a pretty good um indicator of whether or not you're going to get injured and it's something you could pretty much always keep in mind for programming for strength and power and hypertrophy i mean i think it all has to be relative like to the individual Mm. um because everybody's going to have a different mrv Mm. and like other factors like that um so like you know if I, if I were to start, I don't know, like I'm just going to make up numbers. So say it was like three by 10 at a hundred kilos of like squatting. Mm. And I do that once a week. If now all of a sudden I go to like three by 10 at a hundred kilos for like four times a week, um, it, you know, that's going to be substantially different of a stress, mm. um, volume wise. And, and it's just the load that you weren't necessarily prepared to handle quite yet. Right. I think people forget that when you're doing a certain volume, that it's that's an expression of volume we've done before. Right. Um, so your tissue is adapted to that point, um, and so sometimes you can kind of like cruise out at certain volumes and still make progress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's. I love the because I don't I I don't even know what volume was like a year ago, eight months ago maybe it was like I had no clue. that even volume was a thing um and i think it's something that i find quite interesting and just the idea of that okay if you roll your ankle and you actually tear something rolling your ankle there's probably things that you did before that to cause you rolling your ankle that time to be an issue um which I i think is interesting and it's it's cool to know the fact that like you rolling your ankle is the thing that happened but there's 80, 80 things that happened before that that probably predisposed you to that, which is cool. Um, and then yeah, it's it's usually not like one event, and and there may be times like two. That's why I do strength training with people because hmm. like yeah, potentially if you were a stronger version of yourself, um, if you did that, we're in that same scenario again. You might roll your ankle, but you might not. It might not hurt that time. Yeah, because yeah. your tissue is more in, inherently resilient now. Mm, mm, mm. I, I, and I, even like your understanding of pain will like inherently make you more resilient as like a person because mm. um, you'd be like hey I rolled my ankle but let me walk around a little bit versus like freak out about it yeah and just realizing that shit like and well, I feel like once you've worked around injuries a few times it's like you realize oh I'm not a cripple now I can just literally change my hand placement or something or just like for instance, my shoulder yeah. injury. I I went from like um, a wide grip pull up to just a close grip pull up, and it was like, okay, cool. What really changed? Like, not that much. Um, I can go back to wide grip in a, in a bit. It's like, cool. It's just a little bit of variation. Not really a big deal. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, I think we'll end it here. Where can people find okay. you online? Every everything to um, you yourself, strength guys, etc. So the, the best place to find me personally is um, at strength and evidence underscore physio, or if you put in my name, um, Jacob H. Templar, I should come up on Instagram. Um, obviously, we're at the strength guys um, on Instagram, as well as our website, the strength guys, I believe it's dot com. Um, uh, my practice has a page to um i work in rochester if you just google my name in rochester new york like some stuff will come up for like local news about me 
in the area. Hey guys, thank you very much for listening to this episode. I hope you give us a review or you really enjoyed the episode. Let me know any feedback. Um, I'm always open to any criticism, anything like that. Reach out to me on Instagram at James underscore Walsham. Or if you'd like to follow my business account, follow at the Hypertrophy Hub. Um, Yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. If you would like to help the show, there's a list of ways to do so in the show notes. But if you're wondering how, the best thing to do is just give us a review on iTunes or just let me know how the show can be improved. Thank you very much.